Act One of The Silver Box by John Galsworthy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Silver Box, a comedy in three acts. Persons of the play. John Barthwick, M.P., a wealthy liberal. Read by Steve Goff. Mrs. Barthwick, his wife. Read by Christine G. Jack Barthwick, their son. Read by David Prickett. Roper, their solicitor. Read by Joseph Tabler. Mrs. Jones, their charwoman. Read by Beth Thomas. Marlowe, their manservant. Read by Adrian Strowett. Wheeler, their maidservant. Read by Sonia. Jones, the stranger within their gates. Read by Peter Tucker. Mrs. Seddon, a landlady. Read by Bev Stevens. Snow, a detective. Read by Todd. A police magistrate. Read by John Burlinson. An unknown lady from beyond. Read by Abai. Livens. Read by Steve Goff. A relieving officer. Read by David Olson. A magistrate's clerk. Read by Mary Kay. An usher. Read by Dylan McFarlane. Narrated by Michelle Eaton. Act One. Scene One. Time the present. The action of the first two acts takes place on Easter Tuesday. The action of the third on Easter Wednesday week. The curtain rises on the Barthwick's drawing room, large, modern, and well furnished. The window curtains drawn. Electric light is burning. On the large round dining table is set out a tray with whiskey, a siphon, and a silver cigarette box. It is past midnight. A fumbling is heard outside the door. It is opened suddenly. Jack Barthwick seems to fall into the room. He stands holding by the doorknob, staring before him with a beatific smile. He is in evening dress and opera hat and carries in his hand a sky-blue velvet lady's reticule. His boyish face is freshly coloured and clean-shaven. An overcoat is hanging on his arm. Hello. I've got home all right. Defiantly. Who says I should never have opened the door without assistance? He staggers in, fumbling with the reticule. A lady's handkerchief and purse of crimson silk fall out. Serve her jolly well right. Everything dropping out. The cat. I've scored her off. I've got her bag. He swings the reticule. Serves her jolly well right. He takes a cigarette out of the silver box and puts it in his mouth. Never gave the fellow anything. He hunts through all his pockets and pulls a shilling out. It drops and rolls away. He looks for it. Piece of shilling. He looks again. Base in gratitude. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Must tell him. I've got absolutely nothing. He lurches through the door and down a corridor, and presently returns followed by Jones, who is advanced in liquor. Jones, about thirty years of age, has hollow cheeks, black circles round his eyes, and rusty clothes. He looks as though he might be unemployed, and enters in a hangdog manner. Shh, shh, shh. Don't you make a noise. Whatever you do, shut the door and have a drink. Very solemnly. You helped me to open the door. I've got nothing for you. This is my house. My father's name's Barthwick. He's Member of Parliament. Liberal Member of Parliament. I've told you that before. Have a drink. He pours out whiskey and drinks it up. I'm not drunk. Subsiding on a sofa. That's all right. What's your name? My name's Barthwick. So's my father's. I'm a liberal, too. What are you? Jones, in a thick, sardonic voice. I'm a blooming conservative. My name's Jones. My wife works here. She's the char. She works here. Jones? <laughs> There's another Jones at college with me. I'm not a socialist myself. I'm a liberal. There's very little difference because of the principles of the lib liberal party. We're all equal before the law. 
That's wrong. That's silly. <laughs> what was I about to say? Give me some whiskey. Jones gives him the whiskey he desires, together with a squirt of siphon. What I was going to tell you was, I've had a row with her. He waves the reticule. Have a drink, Jones. Should never have got in without you. That's why I'm giving you a drink. Don't care who knows I've scored her off. The cat. He throws his feet up on the sofa. Oh, don't you make a noise, whatever you do. You pour out a drink. You make yourself good, long, long drink. You take cigarette. You take anything you like. Should never have got in without you. Closing his eyes. You're a Tory. You're a Tory socialist. I am liberal myself. Have a drink. I am an excellent chap. His head drops back. He, smiling, falls asleep, and Jones stands looking at him. Then snatching up Jack's glass, he drinks it off. He picks the reticule from off Jack's shirt front, holds it to the light, and smells at it. Been on the tiles and brought home some of your cat's fur. He stuffs it into Jack's breast pocket. Jack murmuring, I scored you off, you cat. Jones looks around him furtively. He pours out whiskey and drinks it. From the silver box he takes a cigarette, puffs at it and drinks more whiskey. There is no sobriety left in him. Fat lot of things they've got here. He sees the crimson purse lying on the floor. More cat's fur. Puss, puss. He fingers it, drops it on the tray, and looks at Jack. Calf! Fat calf! He sees his own presentiment in a mirror. Lifting his hands with fingers spread, he stares at it, then looks again at Jack, clenching his fist as if to batter in his sleeping, smiling face. Suddenly, he tilts the rest of the whiskey into the glass and drinks it. With cunning glee, he takes the silver box and purse and pockets them. I'll score you off too, that's what I'll do. He gives a little snarling laugh and lurches to the door. His shoulder rubs against the switch. The light goes out. There is a sound as of a closing outer door. The curtain falls. The curtain rises again at once. Scene 2 In the Barthwick's dining room, Jack is still asleep. The morning light is coming through the curtains. The time is half past eight. Wheeler, brisk person, enters with a dustpan, and Mrs. Jones more slowly with a scuttle. Wheeler, drawing the curtains. That precious husband of yours was round for you after you'd gone yesterday, Mrs. Jones. Wanted your money for drink, I suppose. He hangs about the corner here half the time. I saw him outside the Golden Bells when I went to the post last night. If I were you, I wouldn't live with him. I wouldn't live with a man that raised his hand to me. I wouldn't put up with it. Why don't you take your children and leave him? If you put up with him, it'll only make him worse. I never can see why, because a man's married you, he should knock you about. Mrs. Jones, slim, dark-eyed and dark-haired, oval-faced and with a smooth, soft, even voice. Her manner patient, her way of talking quite impersonal. She wears a blue linen dress and boots with holes. It was nearly two last night before he came home, and he wasn't himself. He made me get up and he knocked me about. He didn't seem to know what he was saying or doing. Of course, I would leave him. But I'm really afraid of what he'd do to me. He's such a violent man when he's not himself. Why don't you get him locked up? You will never have any peace until you get him locked up. If I were you, I'd go to the police court tomorrow. That's what I would do. Of course, I ought to go, because he does treat me so badly when he's not himself. But you see, Bettina, he has a very hard time. He's been out of work two months, and it preys upon his mind. When he's in work, he behaves himself much better. It's when he's out of work that he's so violent. Well, if you won't take any steps, you will never get rid of him. Of course, it's very wearing to me. I don't get my sleep at nights. And it's not as if I were getting help from him, because I have to do for the children and all of us. And he throws such dreadful things up at me, talks of my having men to follow me about. Such a thing never happens. No man ever speaks to me. And, of course, it's just the other way. It's what he does that's wrong and makes me so unhappy. And then he's always threatening to cut my throat if I leave him. It's all the drink, and the things preying on his mind. 
He's not a bad man, really. Sometimes he'll speak quite kind to me. But I've stood so much from him. I don't feel it in me to speak kind back, but I just keep myself to myself. And he's all right with the children, too, except when he's not himself. You mean when he's drunk, the beauty? Yes. Without change of voice. There's the young gentleman asleep on the sofa. They both look silently at Jack. Mrs. Jones at last in her soft voice. He doesn't look quite himself. He is a young limb, that's what he is. It's my belief he was tipsy last night, like your husband. It's another kind of being out of work that sets him to drink. I'll go and tell Marlowe this is his job. She goes. Mrs. Jones, upon her knees, begins a gentle sweeping. Jack waking. Who's there? What is it? It's me, sir, Mrs. Jones. Jack sitting up and looking round. Where is it? What? What time is it? It's getting on for nine o'clock, sir. For nine? Why, what? Rising and loosening his tongue, putting hands to his head and staring hard at Mrs. Jones. Look here, you Mrs. Mrs. Jones. Don't you say you caught me asleep here? No, sir. Of course I won't, sir. It's quite an accident. I don't know how it happened. I must have forgotten to go to bed. It's a queer thing. I've got a most beastly headache. Mind you don't say anything, Mrs. Jones. Goes out and passes Marlowe in the doorway. Marlowe is young and quiet. He is clean-shaven, and his hair is brushed high from his forehead in a coxcomb. Incidentally, a butler. He is first a man. He looks at Mrs. Jones and smiles a private smile. Not the first time, won't be the last. Looked a bit dicky, eh, Mrs. Jones? He didn't look quite himself. Of course, I didn't take notice. You're used to them. How's your old man? Mrs. Jones softly as throughout. Well, he was very bad last night. He didn't seem to know what he was about. He was very late, and he was most abusive. But now, of course, he's asleep. That's his way of finding a job, eh? As a rule, Mr. Marlowe, he goes out early every morning looking for work, and sometimes he comes in fit to drop. And, of course, I can't say he doesn't try to get it, because he does. Trade's very bad. She stands quite still, her fan and brush before her, at the beginning and the end of long vistas of experience, traversing them with her impersonal eye. But he's not a good husband to me. Last night he hit me, and he was so dreadfully abusive. Bank holiday, eh? He's too fond of the goat and bells. That's what's the matter with him. I see him at the corner late every night. He hangs about. He gets to feeling very low, walking about all day after work and being refused so often, and then when he gets a drop in him it goes to his head. But he shouldn't treat his wife as he treats me. Sometimes I've had to go and walk about at night when he wouldn't let me stay in the room. But he's sorry for it afterwards. And he hangs about after me. He waits for me in the street. And I don't think he ought to, because I've always been a good wife to him. And I tell him Mrs. Barthwick wouldn't like him coming about the place. But that only makes him angry, and he says dreadful things about the gentry. Of course, it was through me that he first lost his place, through his not treating me right, and that's made him bitter against the gentry. He had a very good place as groom in the country, but it made such a stir because, of course, he didn't treat me right. Got the sack? Yes, his employer said he couldn't keep him, because there was a great deal of talk, and he said it was such a bad example. But it's very important for me to keep my work here. I have the three children, and I don't want him to come about after me in the streets and make a disturbance, as he sometimes does. Marlowe, holding up the empty decanter. Not a drain. Next time he hits you, get a witness and go down to the court. Yes, I think I've made up my mind. I think I ought to. That's right. Where's the cigarette? He searches for the silver box. He looks at Mrs. Jones, who is sweeping on her hands and knees. He checks himself and stands reflecting. From the tray he picks two half-smoked cigarettes and reads the name on them. Nestor, where the deuce? With a meditative air he looks again at Mrs. Jones, and taking up Jack's overcoat he searches in the pockets. Wheeler, with a tray of breakfast things, comes in. Marlowe, aside to Wheeler. Have you seen the cigarette box? No. Well, it's gone. I put it on the tray last night, and he's been smoking. 
showing her the ends of cigarettes. It's not in these pockets. He can't have taken it upstairs this morning. Have a good look at his room when he comes down. Who's been in here? Only me and Mrs. Jones. I've finished here. Shall I do the drawing room now? Wheeler, looking at her doubtfully. Have you seen... Better do the Baudoir first. Mrs. Jones goes out with pan and brush. Marlowe and Wheeler look each other in the face. It'll turn up. Wheeler hesitating. You don't think she... Nodding at the door. Marlowe stoutly. I don't. I never believes anything of anybody. But the master will have to be told. You wait a bit and see if it don't turn up. Suspicion's no business of ours. I set my mind against it. The curtain falls. The curtain rises again at once. Scene 3 Barthwick and Mrs. Barthwick are seated at the breakfast table. He is a man between fifty and sixty, quietly important, with a bald forehead and pince nez, and the times in his hands. She is a lady of nearly fifty, well-dressed, with greyish hair, good features and a decided manner. They face each other. Barthwick from behind his paper. The Labour man has got in at the by-election for Barnside, my dear. Another Labour? I can't think what on earth the country is about. I predicted it. It's not a matter of vast importance. Not? How can you take it so calmly, John? To me it's simply outrageous. And there you sit, you liberals, and pretend to encourage these people. Barthwick, frowning. The representation of all parties is necessary for any proper reform, for any proper social policy. I've no patience with you talk of reform, all this nonsense about social policy. We know perfectly well what it is they want. They want things for themselves. Those socialists and labour men are an absolutely selfish set of people. They have no sense of patriotism, like the upper classes. They simply want what we've got. Want what we've got? He stares into space. My dear, what are you talking about? With a contortion. I'm no alarmist. Cream? Quite uneducated men. Wait until they begin to tax our investments. I'm convinced that when they once get a chance, they will tax everything. They've no feeling for the country. You liberals and conservatives, you're all alike. You don't see an inch before your noses. You know imagination, not a scrap of imagination between you. You ought to join hands and nip it in the bud. You're talking nonsense. How is it possible for liberals and conservatives to join hands, as you call it? That shows how absurd it is for women. Why, the very essence of a liberal is to trust in the people. Now, John, eat your breakfast. As if there were any real difference between you and the conservatives. All the upper classes have the same interests to protect and the same principles. Calmly. Oh, you're sitting upon a volcano, John. What? I read a letter in the paper yesterday. I forgot the man's name, but it made the whole thing perfectly clear. You don't look things in the face. Indeed. Heavily. I am a liberal. Drop the subject, please. Toast? I quite agree with what this man says. Education is simply ruining the lower classes. It unsettles them, and that's the worst thing for us all. I see an enormous difference in the manner of servants. Barthwick with suspicious emphasis. I welcome any change that will lead to something better. He opens a letter. Hmm. This is that affair of Master Jack's again. High Street, Oxford. Sir, we have received Mr. John Barthwick, Senior's, draft for forty pounds. Oh, the letters to him. We now enclose the cheque you cashed with us, which, as we stated in our previous letter, was not met on presentation at your bank. We are, sir, yours obediently, Moss and Sons, Tailors. Hmm. Staring at the cheque. Pretty business altogether. The boy might have been prosecuted. Come, John, you know Jack didn't mean anything. He only thought he was overdrawing. I still think his bank ought to have cashed that cheque. They must know your position. Barthwick, replacing in the envelope the letter and the cheque. Much good that would have done him in a court of law. He stops as Jack comes in, fastening his waistcoat and staunching a razor cut upon his chin. Jack, sitting down between them and speaking with an artificial joviality. Sorry I'm late. He looks, 
lugubriously at the dishes tea please mother any letters for me barthwick hands the letter to him but look here i say this has been opened i do wish you wouldn't barthwick touching the envelope i suppose i'm entitled to this name jack sulkily well i can't help having your name father he reads the letter and mutters brutes barthwick eyeing him you don't deserve to be so well out of that haven't you ragged me enough dad yes john let jack have his breakfast if you hadn't had me to come to where would you have been it's the merest accident suppose you had been the son of a poor man or a clerk obtaining money with a cheque you knew your bank could not meet it might have ruined you for life i can't see what's to become of you if these are your principles i never did anything of the sort myself i expect you always had lots of money if you've got plenty of money of course on the contrary i had not your advantages my father kept me very short of money how much had you dad it's not material the question is do you feel the gravity of what you did i don't know about the gravity of course i'm very sorry if you think it was wrong haven't i said so i should never have done it at all if i hadn't been so jolly hard up how much of that forty pounds have you got left jack jack hesitating i don't know not much how much jack desperately i haven't got any what i know i've got the most beastly headache he leans his head on his hand headache my dear boy can't you eat any breakfast jack drawing in his breath too jolly bad i'm so sorry come with me dear i'll give you something that will take it away at once they leave the room and barthwick tearing up the letter goes to the fireplace and puts the pieces in the fire while he is doing this marlow comes in and looking round him is about quietly to withdraw what's that what do you want i was looking for mr john sir what do you want mr john for marlow with hesitation i thought i should find him in here sir barthwick suspiciously yes but what do you want him for marlow off-handedly there's a lady called asked to speak to him for a minute sir a lady at this time in the morning what sort of lady marlow without expression in his voice i can't tell sir no particular sort she might be after charity she might be a sister of mercy i should think sir is she dressed like one no sir she's in plain clothes sir didn't she say what she wanted no sir where did you leave her in the hall sir in the hall how do you know she's not a thief not got designs on the house no sir i, I don't fancy so sir well sure in here i'll see her myself marlow goes out with a private gesture of dismay he soon returns ushering in a young pale lady with dark eyes and pretty figure in a modish black but rather shabby dress a black and white trimmed hat with a bunch of parma violets wrongly placed and fuzzy spotted veil at the sight of mr barthwick she exhibits every sign of nervousness marlow goes out oh but i beg pardon there's some mistake she turns to fly whom did you want to see madam unknown lady stopping and looking back it was mr john barthwick i wanted to see i am john barthwick madam what can i have the pleasure of doing for you oh i i don't she drops her eyes barthwick scrutinizes her and purses his lips it was my son perhaps you wished to see unknown lady quickly yes of course it's your son may i ask whom i have the pleasure of speaking to unknown lady appeal and hardiness upon his face my name is oh it doesn't matter i don't want to make any fuss i i just want to see your son for a minute in fact i must see him barthwick controlling his uneasiness my son is not very well if necessary no doubt i could attend to the matter be so kind as to let me know oh but i must see him i've come on purpose she bursts out nervously 
I don't want to make any fuss, but the fact is, last, last night your son took away, he took away my... She stops. Barthwick severely. Yes, madam, what? He took away my, my reticule. Your reticule? I don't care about the reticule. It's not that I want... I'm sure I don't want to make any fuss. Her face is quivering. But... but... all my money was in it. In what? In what? In my purse. In the reticule. It was a crimson silk purse. Really, I wouldn't have come. I don't want to make any fuss. But I must get my money back, mustn't I? Do you tell me that my son... Oh, well, you see, he wasn't quite... I mean, he was... She smiles mesmerically. I beg your pardon. Unknown lady stamping her foot. Oh, don't you see? Tipsy. We had a quarrel. Barthwick scandalised. How? Where? Unknown lady defiantly. At my place? We'd had supper at the, uh, and your son. Barthwick pressing the bell. May I ask how you knew this house? Did he give you his name and address? Unknown lady glancing sidelong. I got it out of his overcoat. Barthwick sardonically. Oh, you got it out of his overcoat. And may I ask if my son will know you by daylight? Know me? I should jolly... I mean, of course he will. Marlowe comes in. Ask Mr. John to come down. Marlowe goes out and Barthwick walks uneasily about. And how long have you enjoyed his acquaintanceship? Only since... only since Good Friday. I am at a loss. I repeat, I am at a... He glances at this unknown lady, who stands with eyes cast down, twisting her hands, and suddenly Jack appears. He stops on seeing who is here, and the unknown lady hysterically giggles. There is a silence. Barthwick portentously. This uh, young lady says that last night, I think you said last night, madam, you took away... Unknown lady impulsively. My reticule and all my money was in a crimson silk purse. Reticule? Looking round for any chance to get away. I don't know anything about it. Barthwick sharply. Come, do you deny seeing this young lady last night? Deny? No, of course. Whispering. Why did you give me away like this? What on earth did you come here for? Unknown lady tearfully. I'm sure I didn't want to. It's not likely, is it? You snatched it out of my hand. You know you did. And the purse had all my money in it. I didn't follow you last night because I didn't want to make a fuss and it was so late and you were so... Come, sir. Don't turn your back on me. Explain. Jack, desperately. I don't remember anything about it. In a low voice to his friend. Why on earth couldn't you have written? Unknown lady, sullenly. I want it now. I must have it. I've got to pay my rent today. She looks at Barthwick. They're only too glad to jump on people who are not... Not well off. I don't remember anything about it, really. I don't remember anything about last night at all. He puts his hand up to his head. It's all cloudy, and I've got such a beastly headache. But you took it. You know you did. You said you'd score me off. Well, then it must be here. I remember now. I remember something. Why did I take the beastly thing? Yes, why did you take the beastly... He turns abruptly to the window. Unknown lady with her mesmeric smile. You weren't quite... were you? Jack smiling pallidly. I'm awfully sorry. If there's anything I can do... Do? You can restore this property, I suppose. I'll go and have a look, but I really don't think I've got it. He goes out hurriedly, and Barthwick, placing a chair, motions to the visitor to sit. Then, with pursed lips, he stands and eyes her fixedly. She sits and steals a look at him, then turns away, and drawing up her veil, stealthily wipes her eyes, and Jack comes back. Jack, ruefully holding out the empty reticule. Is that the thing? 
I've looked all over. I can't find the purse anywhere. Are you sure it was there? Unknown lady, tearfully. Sure? Of course I'm sure. A crimson silk purse, it was all the money I had. I really am awfully sorry. My head's so jolly bad. I've asked the butler, but he hasn't seen it. I must have my money. Oh, of course. That'll be all right. I'll see that that's all right. How much? Unknown lady, sullenly. Seven pounds twelve. It's all I've got in the world. That'll be all right. I'll send you a cheque. Unknown lady, eagerly. No, now, please. Give me what was in my purse. I've got to pay my rent this morning. They won't give me another day. I'm a fortnight behind already. Jack, blankly. I'm awfully sorry. I really haven't a penny in my pocket. He glances stealthily at Barthwick. Unknown lady, excitedly. Come, I say you must. It's my money and you took it. I'm not going away without it. They'll turn me out of my place. Jack, clasping his head. But I can't give you what I haven't got. Didn't I tell you I haven't a beastly scent? Unknown lady tearing at her handkerchief. Oh, do give it me. She puts her hands together in appeal. Then, with sudden fierceness. If you don't, I'll summons you. It's stealing, that's what it is. Barthwick uneasily. One moment, please. As a matter of uh, principle, I shall settle this claim. He produces money. Here is eight pounds. The extra will cover the value of the purse and your cab fares. I need make no comment. No thanks are necessary. Touching the bell, he holds the door ajar in silence. The unknown lady stores the money in her reticule. She looks from Jack to Barthwick, and her face is quivering faintly with a smile. She hides it with her hand and steals away. Behind her, Barthwick shuts the door. Barthwick with solemnity. Hmm, this is a nice thing to happen. Jack, impersonally. What awful luck! So this is the way that forty pounds has gone. One thing after another. Once more I should like to know where you'd have been if it hadn't been for me. You don't seem to have any principles. You're one of those who are a nuisance to society. You, you're dangerous. What your mother would say, I don't know. Your conduct, as far as I can see, is absolutely unjustifiable. It's, it's criminal. Why, a poor man who behaved as you've done, do you think he'd have any mercy shown him? What you want is a good lesson. You and your sort are... He speaks with feeling. A nuisance to the community. Don't ask me to help you next time. You're not fit to be helped. Jack, turning upon his sire with unexpected fierceness. All right. I won't then, and see how you like it. You wouldn't have helped me this time, I know, if you hadn't been scared the thing would get into the papers. Where are the cigarettes? Barthwick, regarding him uneasily. Well, I'll say no more about it. He rings the bell. I'll pass it over for this once, but... Marlowe comes in. You can clear away. He hides his face behind the times. Jack brightening. I say, Marlowe, where are the cigarettes? I put the box out with the whiskey last night, sir. But this morning, I can't find it anywhere. Did you look in my room? Yes, sir. I've looked all over the house. I found two nester ends in the tray this morning. So you must have been smoking last night, sir. Hesitating. I'm really afraid someone's purloined the box. Jack uneasily. Stolen it? What's that? The cigarette box? Is anything else missing? No, sir. I've been through the place. Was the house all right this morning? None of the windows open? No, sir. Quietly to Jack. You left your latchkey in the door last night, sir. He hands it back, unseen by Barthwick. Tss. Who's been in the room this morning? Me and Wheeler. And Mrs. Jones is all, sir, as far as I know. Have you asked Mrs. Barthwick? To Jack. Go and ask your mother if she's had it. Ask her to look and see if she's missed anything else. Jack goes upon this mission. Nothing is more disquieting than losing things like this. No, sir. Have you any suspicions? No, sir. 
This Mrs. Jones, how long has she been working here? Only this last month, sir. What sort of person? I don't know much about her, sir. Seems a very quiet, respectable woman. Who did the room this morning? Wheeler and Mrs. Jones, sir. Barthwick, with his forefinger upraised. Now, was this Mrs. Jones in the room alone at any time? Marlow expressionless. Yes, sir. How do you know that? Marlow reluctantly. I found her here, sir. And has Wheeler been in the room alone? No, sir, she's not, sir. I should say, sir, that Mrs. Jones seems a very honest. Barthwick holding up his hand. I want to know this. Has this Mrs. Jones been here the whole morning? Yes, sir. No, sir. She stepped over to the greengrocer's for cook. Hmm. Is she in the house now? Yes, sir. Very good. I shall make a point of clearing this up. On principle, I shall make a point of fixing the responsibility. It goes to the foundations of security in all your interests. Yes, sir. What sort of circumstances is this Mrs. Jones in? Is her husband in work? I believe not, sir. Very well. Say nothing about it to anyone. Tell Wheeler not to speak of it, and ask Mrs. Jones to step up here. Very good, sir. Marlowe goes out, his face concerned, and Barthwick stays, his face judicial and a little pleased, as befits a man conducting an inquiry. Mrs. Barthwick and her son come in. Well, my dear, you've not seen it, I suppose. No, but what an extraordinary thing, John. Marlowe, of course, is out of the question. I'm certain none of the maids are for cook. Oh, cook. Of course. It's perfectly detestable to me to suspect anybody. It's not a question of one's feelings. It's a question of justice. On principle. I shouldn't be a bit surprised if the chairwoman knew something about it. It was Laura who recommended her. Barthwick judiciously. I am going to have Mrs. Jones up. Leave it to me. And uh, remember that nobody is guilty until they're proved so. I shall be careful. I have no intention of frightening her. I shall give her every chance. I hear she's in poor circumstances. If we are not able to do much for them, we are bound to have the greatest sympathy with the poor. Mrs. Jones comes in, pleasantly. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones, soft and even unemphatic. Good morning, sir. Good morning, ma'am. About your husband. He is not in work, I hear. No, sir. Of course, he's not in work just now. Then I suppose he's earning nothing. No, sir. He's not earning anything just now, sir. And how many children have you? Three children. But, of course, they don't eat very much, sir. A little silence. And how old is the eldest? Nine years old, sir. Do they go to school? Yes, sir. They all three go to school every day. Barthwick, severely. And what about their food when you're out at work? Well, sir, I have to give them their dinner to take with them. Of course, I'm not always able to give them anything. Sometimes I have to send them without, but my husband is very good about the children when he's in work. But when he's not in work, of course, he's a very difficult man. He drinks, I suppose? Yes, sir. Of course, I can't say he doesn't drink, because he does. And I suppose he takes all your money? No, sir. He's very good about my money, except when he's not himself. And then, of course, he treats me very badly. Now, what is he, your husband? By profession, sir. Of course, he's a groom. A groom? How came he to lose his place? He lost his place a long time ago, sir, and he's never had a very long job since. And now, of course, the motor cars are against him. When were you married to him, Mrs. Jones? Eight years ago, sir. That was in... Mrs. Barthwick, sharply. Eight? You said the eldest child was nine? Yes, ma'am. Of course, that was why he lost his place. He didn't treat me rightly, and of course his employer said he couldn't keep him because of the example. You mean he... <clears throat> yes, sir. And, of course, after he lost his place, he married me. You actually mean to say that you... you were... My dear. Mrs. Barthwick indignantly. How disgraceful! Barthwick hurriedly. And where are you living now, Mrs. Jones? We've not got a home, sir. Of course, we've been obliged to put away most of our things. Put your things away? You mean to, uh, pawn them? Yes, sir, to put them away. We're living in Merthyr Street, that is close by here, sir, at number 34. We just have the one room. And what do you pay a week? 
We pay six shillings a week, sir, for a furnished room. And I suppose you're behind in the rent? Yes, sir. We're a little behind in the rent. But you're in good work, aren't you? Well, sir, I have a day in Stamford Place Thursdays, and Mondays and Wednesdays and Fridays I come here, but today, of course, is a half day, because of yesterday's bank holiday. I see. Four days a week and you get half a crown a day. Is that it? Yes, sir, and my dinner. But sometimes it's only half a day, and that's eighteen pence. And when your husband earns anything, he spends it in drink, I suppose? Sometimes he does, sir, and sometimes he gives it to me for the children. Of course, he would work if he could get it, sir, but it seems there are a great many people out of work. Ah, yes, we uh, won't go into that. Sympathetically. And how about your work here? Do you find it hard? Oh, no, sir, not very hard, sir, except, of course, when I don't get my sleep at night. Ah, and you help do all the rooms. And sometimes, I suppose, you go out for cook? Yes, sir. And you've been out this morning? Yes, sir. Of course, I had to go to the greengrocer's. Exactly. So your husband earns nothing, and he's a bad character? No, sir, I don't say that, sir. I think there's a great deal of good in him, though he does treat me very bad sometimes. And, of course, I don't like to leave him, but I think I ought to, because, really, I hardly know how to stay with him. He often raises his hand to me. Not long ago he gave me a blow here. Touches her breast. And I can feel it now. So I think I ought to leave him, don't you, sir? Ah, uh, I can't help you there. It's a very serious thing to leave your husband. Very serious thing. Yes, sir. Of course, I'm afraid of what he might do to me if I were to leave him. He can be so very violent. Hmm. Well, that I can't pretend to say anything about. It's the bad principle I'm speaking of. Yes, sir. I know nobody can help me. I know I must decide for myself, and, of course, I know that he has had a very hard life, and he's fond of the children, and it's very hard for him to see them going without food. Barthwick hastily. Well, uh, thank you. I just wanted to hear about you. I don't think I need detain you any longer, Mrs. Jones. No, sir. Thank you, sir. Good morning, then. Good morning, sir. Good morning, ma'am. Barthwick exchanging glances with his wife. By the way, Mrs. Jones, I think it only fair to tell you a silver cigarette box uh, is missing. Mrs. Jones looking from one face to the other. I'm very sorry, sir. Yes. You have not seen it, I suppose. Mrs. Jones realising that suspicion is upon her with an uneasy movement. Where was it, sir, if you please, sir? Barthwick evasively. Uh, where did Marlow say? Uh, in this room, yes, in this room. No, sir, I haven't seen it. Of course, if I'd seen it, I should have noticed it. Barthwick giving her a rapid glance. You, you are sure of that? Mrs. Jones impassively. Yes, sir. With a slow nodding of her head. I have not seen it. And, of course, I don't know where it is. She turns and goes quietly out. Hmm. The three Barthwicks avoid each other's glances. The curtain falls. End of Act One Act Two of The Silver Box by John Galsworthy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One. The Joneses' lodgings, Merthyr Street, at half past two o'clock. The bare room, with tattered oilcloth and damp, distempered walls, has an air of tidy wretchedness. On the bed lies Jones, half-dressed. His coat is thrown across his feet, and muddy boots are lying on the floor close by. He is asleep. The door is opened, and Mrs. Jones comes in, dressed in a pinched black jacket and old black sailor hat. She carries a parcel wrapped up in the times. She puts her parcel down, unwraps an apron, half a loaf, two onions, three potatoes, and a tiny piece of bacon. Taking a teapot from the cupboard, she rinses it, shakes into it some powdered tea out of a screw of paper, puts it on the hearth, and sitting in a wooden chair, quietly begins to cry. Jones stirring and yawning. <sighs> Is that you? What's the time? Mrs. Jones, drying her eyes and in her usual voice. Half past two. 
What are you back so soon for? I only had the half day today, Jim. Jones on his back and in a drowsy voice. Got anything for dinner? Mrs. Barthwick's cook gave me a little bit of bacon. I'm going to make a stew. She prepares for cooking. There's fourteen shillings owing for rent, James, and of course I've only got two and fourpence. They'll be coming for it today. Jones, turning towards her on his elbow. Let him come and find my surprise packet. I've had enough of this trying for work. Why should I go round and round after a job like a blooming squirrel in a cage? Give us a job, sir. Take a man on. Got a wife and three children. Sick of it, I am. I'd sooner lie here and rot. Jones, you come and join the demonstration. Come and hold a flag. And listen to the ruddy orators and go home as empty as you came. There's some that seems to like that. The sheep. When I go seeking for a job now and see the brutes looking me up and down, it's like a thousand serpents in me. I'm not asking for any treat. A man wants to sweat his soul silly and not allowed that's a rum start, ain't it? A man wants to sweat his soul out to keep the breath in him and ain't allowed. That's justice, that's freedom and all the rest of it. He turns his face towards the wall. You're so milky mild, you don't know what goes on inside of me. I'm done with the silly game. If they want me, let them come for me. Mrs. Jones stops cooking and stands unmoving at the table. I've tried and done with it, I tell you. I've never been afraid of what's before me. You mark my words. If you think they've broke my spirit, you're mistook. I'll lie and rot sooner than ask them again. What makes you stand like that, you long-suffering, God-forsaken image? That's why I can't keep my hands off you. So now you know. Work! You can work, but you haven't a spirit of a louse. Mrs. Jones, quietly. You talk more wild sometimes when you're yourself, James, than when you're not. If you don't get work, how are we to go on? They won't let us stay here. They're looking for their money today, I know. I see this Bathwick of yours every day going down to Parliament snug and comfortable to talk his silly soul out. And I see that young calf, his son, swelling it about and going on the razzle-dazzle. What have they done that makes them any better than what I am? They never did a day's work in their lives. I see them day after day. And I wish you wouldn't come after me like that and hang about the house. You don't seem able to keep away at all, and whatever you do it for I can't think, because of course they notice it. I suppose I may go where I like. Where may I go? The other day I went to a place in Edgware Road. Governor, I says to the boss, take me on, I says. I haven't done a stroke of work not these two months. It takes the heart out of a man, I says. I'm one to work. I'm not afraid of anything you can give me. May good man, he says. I've had thirty of you here this morning. I took the first two, he says, and that's all I want. Thank you, then rot the world, I says. Blaspheming, he says, is not the way to get a job. Out you go, my lad. <laughs> Don't you raise your voice because you're starving. Don't you even think of it. Take it lying down. Take it like a sensible man, can't you? And a little way down the street a lady says to me, Do you want to earn a few pence, my man? And gives me a dog to hold outside a shop. Fat as a butler he was. Tons of meat had gone to the making of him. It did her good, it did. Made her feel herself that charitable. But I see her looking at the copper standing alongside of me. For fear I should make off with a blooming fat dog. He sits on the edge of the bed and puts a boot on, then looking up. What's in that head of yours? Almost pathetically. Can't you speak for once? There is a knock, and Mrs. Seddon, the landlady, appears, an obnoxious, harassed, shabby woman in working clothes. I thought I heard you come in, Mrs. Jones. I've spoke to my husband, but he says he really can't afford to wait another day. Jones, with scowling jocularity. Never you mind what your husband says. You go your own way like a proper independent woman. 
Here, Jinny, chuck her there. Producing a sovereign from his trousers pocket, he throws it to his wife, who catches it in her apron with a gasp. Jones resumes the lacing of his boots. Mrs. Jones rubbing the sovereign stealthily. I'm very sorry we're so late with it, and of course it's fourteen shillings, so if you've got six that will be right. Mrs. Seddon takes the sovereign and fumbles for the change. Jones with his eyes fixed on his boots. Bit of a surprise for you, ain't it? Thank you, and I'm sure I'm very much obliged. She does indeed appear surprised. I'll bring you the change. Jones mockingly. Don't mention it. Thank you, and I'm sure I'm very much obliged. She slides away. Mrs. Jones gazes at Jones, who is still lacing up his boots. I've had a bit of luck. Pulling out the crimson purse and some loose coins. Picked up a purse. Seven pound and more. Oh, James. Oh, James. What about old James? I picked it up, I tell you. This is lost property, this is. But isn't there a name in it or something? Name? No, there ain't no name. This don't belong to such as have visiting cards. This belongs to a perfect lady. Dark and smell it. He pitches her the purse, which she puts gently to her nose. Now, you tell me what I ought to have done. You tell me that. You can always tell me what I ought to have done, can't you? Mrs. Jones laying down the purse. I can't say what you ought to have done, James. Of course, the money wasn't yours. You've taken somebody else's money. Findings keeping. I'll take it as wages for the time I've gone about the streets asking for what's my rights. I'll take it for what's overdue, do you hear? With strange triumph. I've got money in my pocket, my girl. Mrs. Jones goes on again with the preparation of the meal. Jones looks at her furtively. Money in my pocket, and I'm not going to waste it. With this here money, I'm going to Canada. I'll let you have a pound. A silence. You've often talked of leaving me. You've often told me I'd treat you badly. Well, I hope you'll be glad when I'm gone. Mrs. Jones impassively. You have treated me very badly, James, and of course I can't prevent your going, but I can't tell whether I shall be glad when you're gone. It'll change my luck. I've had nothing but bad luck since I first took up with you. More softly. And you've had no blooming picnic. Of course, it would have been better for us if we had never met. We weren't meant for each other. But you're set against me, that's what you are, and you have been for a long time. And you treat me so badly, James, going after that Rosie and all. You don't ever seem to think of the children that I've had to bring into the world, and of all the trouble I've had to keep them, and what'll become of them when you're gone. Jones crossing the room gloomily. If you think I want to leave the little beggars, you're blooming well mistaken. Of course, I know you're fond of them. Jones fingering the purse half angrily. Well, then you stow it, old girl. The kids will get along better with you than when I'm here. If I'd have known as much as I do now, I'd never had one of them. What's the use of bringing them into a state of things like this? It's a crime, that's what it is. But you find it out too late. That's what's the matter with this ear world. He puts the purse back in his pocket. Of course it would have been better for them, the poor little things, but they're your own children, and I wonder at you talking like that. I should miss them dreadfully if I was to lose them. Jones sullenly. And you ain't the only one. If I make money out there... Looking up, he sees her shaking out his coat. In a changed voice. Leave that coat alone. The silver box drops from the pocket, scattering the cigarettes upon the bed. Taking up the box, she stares at it. He rushes at her and snatches the box away. Mrs. Jones cowering back against the bed. Oh, Jim! Oh, Jim! Jones dropping the box onto the table. You mind what you're saying. When I go out, I'll take and chuck it in the water along with that there purse. I had it when I was in liquor. And for what you do when you're in liquor, you're not responsible. And that's God's truth, as you ought to know. I don't want the thing. I won't have it. 
i took it out of spite i'm no thief i tell you and don't you call me one or it'll be the worse for you mrs jones twisting her apron strings it's mr barthwick's you've taken away my reputation oh jim whatever made you what do you mean it's been missed they think it's me oh whatever made you do it jim i'll tell you i was in liquor i don't want it what's the good of it to me if i were to pawn it they'd only nab me i'm no thief i'm no worse than what that young barthwick is he brought home that purse that i picked up a lady's purse added off her in a row kept saying he'd scored her off well i scored him off tight as an owl he was and do you think anything will happen to him mrs jones as though speaking to herself oh jim it's the bread out of our mouths is it then i'll make it hot for em yet what about that purse what about young barthwick mrs jones comes forward to the table and tries to take the box jones prevents her i'll take it back and tell them all about it she attempts to wrest the box from him ah oh, would you he drops the box and rushes on her with a snarl she slips back past the bed he follows a chair is overturned the door is opened snow comes in a detective in plain clothes and bowler hat with clipped moustaches jones drops his arms mrs jones stands by the window gasping snow advancing swiftly to the table puts his hand on the silver box doing a bit of skylarkin figure this is what i'm after j b the very same he gets back to the door scrutinizing the crest and cipher on the box to mrs jones i'm a police officer are you mrs jones yes sir my instructions are to take you on a charge of stealing this box from j barthwith esq m p of six rockingham gate anything you say may be used against you well missus mrs jones in her quiet voice still out of breath her hand upon her breast of course i did not take it sir i've never taken anything that didn't belong to me and of course i know nothing about it you were at the home this morning you did the room in which the box was left you were alone in the room i find the box here you say you didn't take it yes sir of course i say i did not take it because i did not then how does the box come to be here i would rather not say anything about it is this your husband yes sir this is my husband sir do you wish to say anything before i take her jones remains silent with his head bent down well then missus i'll just trouble you to come along with me quietly mrs jones twisting her hands of course i wouldn't say i hadn't taken it if i had and I, I didn't take it. Indeed, I didn't. Of course, I know appearances are against me, and I can't tell you what really happened, but my children are at school, and they'll be coming home, and I don't know what they'll do without me. Your husband will see to them. Don't you worry. He takes the woman gently by the arm. You drop it. She's all right. Sullenly. I took the thing myself. Snow eyeing him there there it does you credit come along missus jones passionately drop it i say you blooming dick she's my wife she's a respectable woman take her if you dare no no what's the good of this keep a civil tongue and it'll be the better for all of us he puts his whistle in his mouth and draws the woman to the door jones with a rush drop her and put up your hands or i'll soon make you you leave her alone will you don't i tell you i took the thing myself snow blowing his whistle drop your hands or i'll take you too ah would you jones closing deals him a blow a policeman in uniform appears there is a short struggle and jones is overpowered mrs jones raises her hands and drops her face on them the curtain falls scene two the barthwick's dining room the same evening the barthwick's are seated at dessert 
john a silence broken by the cracking of nuts john i wish you'd speak about the nuts they're uneatable he puts one in his mouth it's not the season for them i called on holyrood barthwick fills his glass with port crackers please dad barthwick passes the crackers his demeanour is reflective lady holyrood has got very stout i've noticed it coming for a long time barthwick gloomily stout he takes up the crackers with transparent airiness the Hollywoods have some trouble with their servants, haven't they? Crackers, please, Dad. Barthwick passing the crackers. It got into the papers. The cook, wasn't it? No, the lady's mate. I was talking it over with Lady Holyrood. The girl used to have her young man to see her. Barthwick uneasily. I'm not sure they were wise. My dear John, what are you talking about? How could there be any alternative? Think of the effect on the other servants. Of course, in principle, I wasn't thinking of that. Jack maliciously. Crackers, please, Dad. Barthwick is compelled to pass the crackers. Lady Holyrood told me I had her up, she said. I said to her, you leave my house at once. I think your conduct disgraceful. I can't tell. I don't know, and I don't wish to know what you were doing. I send you away on principle. You need not come to me for a character. And the girl said, If you don't give me my notice, my lady, I want a month's wages. I am perfectly respectable. I have done nothing. Done nothing? Mm. Servants have too much license. They hang together so terribly, you never can tell that they're really thinking. It's as if they are all in conspiracy to keep you in the dark. Even with Marlowe, you feel that he never lets you know what's really in his mind. I hate the secretiveness. It destroys all confidence. I feel sometimes I should like to shake him. Marlowe's a decent chap. It's simply beastly everyone knowing your affairs. The less you say about that, the better. It goes all through the lower classes. You cannot tell when they are speaking the truth. Today, when I was shopping after leaving the Holyrood, one of these unemployed came up and spoke to me. I suppose I only had twenty yards or so to walk to the carnage, but he seemed to spring up in the street. Ah, you must be very careful whom you speak to in these days. I didn't answer him, of course, but I could see at once that he wasn't telling the truth. Barthwick cracking a nut. There's one very good rule. Look at their eyes. Crackers, please, Dad. Barthwick passing the crackers. If their eyes are straightforward, I sometimes give them a sixpence. It's against my principles, but it's most difficult to refuse. If you see that they're desperate and dull and shifty-looking, as so many of them are, it's certain to mean drink, or crime, or something unsatisfactory. This man had dreadful eyes. He looked as if he could commit murder. I've had nothing to eat all day, he said. Just like that. What was William about? He ought to have been waiting. Jack raising his wine-glass to his nose. Is this the sixty-three, Dad? Barthwick, holding his wine-glass to his eye, lowers it and passes it before his nose. I hate people that don't speak the truth. Father and son exchange a look behind their port. It's just as easy to speak the truth as not. I've always found it easy enough. It makes it impossible to tell what is genuine. One feels as if one were continually being taken in. Barthwick sententiously. The lower classes are their own enemies. If they would only trust us, they would get on so much better. But even then, it's so often their own fault. Look at that, Mrs. Jones, this morning. I only want to do what's right in that matter. I had occasion to see Roper this afternoon. I mentioned it to him. He's coming in this evening. It all depends on what the detective says. I've had my doubts. I've been thinking it over. The woman impressed me most unfavourably. She seemed to have no shame. The affair she was talking about... She and the man, when they were young, so immoral. And before you and Jack, I could have put her out of the room. Oh, I don't want to excuse them, but in looking at these matters one must consider... Perhaps you'll say the man's employer was wrong in dismissing him. Of course not. It's not there that I feel doubt. What I ask myself is... Port, please, Dad. Barthwick, 
circulating the decanter in religious imitation of the rising and setting of the sun. I ask myself whether we are sufficiently careful in making inquiries about people before we engage them, especially as regards moral conduct. Pass the port, please, mother. Mrs. Barthwick passing it. My dear boy, aren't you drinking too much? Jack fills his glass. Marlowe entering. Detective Snow to see you, sir. Barthwick uneasily. Ah, say I'll be with him in a minute. Mrs. Barthwick without turning. Let him come in here, Marlowe. Snow enters in an overcoat, his bowler hat in hand. Barthwick half rising. Oh, good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening, ma'am. I've called round to report what I've done. Rather late, I'm afraid. Another case took me away. He takes the silver box out of his pocket, causing a sensation in the Barthwick family. This is the identical article, I believe. Certainly, certainly. Having your crest and cipher, as you described to me, sir, I'd no hesitation in the matter. Excellent. Will you have a glass of, uh, sherry? Pours out sherry. Jack, just give Mr. Snow this. Jack rises and gives the glass to Snow, then lolling in his chair, regards him indolently. Snow, drinking off wine and putting down the glass. After seeing you, I went round to this woman's lodgings, sir. It's a low neighbourhood, and I thought it as well to place a constable below, and not without he was wanted, as things turned out. Indeed. Yes, sir, I had some trouble. I asked her to account for the presence of the article. She could give me no answer, except to deny the theft. So I took her into custody. Then her husband came for me, so I was obliged to take him, too, for assault. He was very violent on the way to the station, very violent, threatened you and your son, and altogether he was a handful, I can tell you. What a ruffian he must be! Yes, ma'am, a rough customer. Jack, sipping his wine, bemused. Punch the beggar's head. Given to drink, as I understand, sir. It's to be hoped he will get a severe punishment. The odd thing is, sir, that he persists in saying he took the box himself. Took the box himself? He smiles. What does he think to gain by that? He says the young gentleman was intoxicated last night. Jack stops the cracking of a nut and looks at Snow. Barthwick, losing his smile, has put his wine glass down. There is a silence. Snow, looking from face to face, remarks. Took him into the house and gave him a whiskey. And under the influence of an empty stomach, the man says he took the box. The impudent wretch! Do you mean that he uh, intends to put this forward tomorrow? That'll be his line, sir. But whether he's endeavouring to shield his wife, or whether... He looks at Jack. There's something in it will be for the magistrate to say. Mrs. Barthwick haughtily. Something in what? I don't understand you. As if my son would bring a man like that into the house. Barthwick from the fireplace, with an effort to be calm. My son can speak for himself, no doubt. Well, Jack, what do you say? Mrs. Barthwick sharply. What does he say? Why, of course he says the whole story stuff. Jack embarrassed. Well, of course I... Of course I, I don't know anything about it. I should think not indeed. To Snow. The man is an audacious ruffian. Barthwick suppressing jumps. But in view of my son's saying there's nothing in this, this fable, will it be necessary to proceed against the man under the circumstances? We shall have to charge him with the assault, sir. It would be as well for your son to come down to the court. There'll be a remand, no doubt. The queer thing is there was quite a sum of money found on him, and a crimson silk purse. Barthwick starts. Jack rises and sits down again. I suppose the lady hasn't missed her purse? Barthwick hastily. Oh, no! Oh, no! No! Mrs. Barthwick dreamily. No! To Snow. 
I've been inquiring of the servants. This man does hang about the house. I shall feel much safer if he gets a good long sentence. I do think we ought to be protected against such ruffians. Yes, yes, of course, on principle. But in this case, we have a number of things to think of. To snow. I suppose, as you say, the man must be charged, eh? No question about that, sir. Barthwick staring gloomily at Jack. This prosecution goes very much against the grain with me. I have great sympathy with the poor. In my position, I am bound to recognise the distress there is amongst them. The condition of the people leaves much to be desired. Do you follow me? I wish I could see my way to drop it. Mrs. Barthwick sharply. John, it's simply not fair to other people. It's putting property at the mercy of anyone who likes to take it. Barthwick trying to make signs to her aside. I'm not defending him, not at all. I'm trying to look at the matter broadly. Nonsense, John. There's a time for everything. Snow, rather sardonically. I might point out, sir, that to withdraw the charge of stealing would not make much difference, because the facts must come out. He looks significantly at Jack. In reference to the assault. And as I said, that charge will have to go forward. Barthwick hastily. Yes, oh, exactly. It's entirely on the woman's account, entirely a matter of my own private feelings. If I were you, sir, I should let things take their course. It's not likely there'll be much difficulty. These things are very quick settled. Barthwick doubtfully. You think so? You think so? Jack rousing himself. I say, what shall I have to swear to? That's best known to yourself, sir. Retreating to the door. Better employ a solicitor, sir, in case anything should arise. We shall have the butler to prove the loss of the article. You'll excuse me going. I'm rather pressed tonight. The case may come on any time after eleven. Good evening, sir. Good evening, ma'am. I shall have to produce the box in court tomorrow, so if you'll excuse me, sir, I may as well take it with me. He takes the silver box and leaves them with a little bow. Barthwick makes a move to follow him, then dashing his hands beneath his coat-tails, speaks with desperation. I do wish you'd leave me to manage things myself. You will put your nose into matters you know nothing of. A pretty mess you've made of this. Mrs. Barthwick coldly. I don't in the least know what you are talking about. If you can't stand up for your rights, I can. I've no patience with your principles. It's such nonsense. Principles? Good heavens! What have principles to do with it, for goodness sake? Don't you know that Jack was drunk last night? Dad! Mrs. Barthwick, in horror, rising. Jack! Look here, Mother. I had supper. Everybody does. I mean to say... You know what I mean. It's absurd to call it being drunk. At Oxford, everybody gets a bit on sometimes. Well, I think it most dreadful. If that is really what you do at Oxford... Jack angrily. Well, why did you send me there? One must do as other fellows do. It's such nonsense, I mean, to call it being drunk. Of course I'm awfully sorry. I've had such a beastly headache all day. If you'd only had the common decency to remember what happened when you came in. Then we should know what truth there was in what this fellow says. As it is, it's all the most confounded darkness. Jack, staring as though at half-formed visions. I just get a... and then it's gone. Oh, Jack! Do you mean to say that you were so tipsy you can't even remember? Look here, Mother. Of course I remember I came. I must have come. Barthwick, unguardedly and walking up and down. <laughs> and that infernal purse. Good heavens, it'll get into the papers. Who on earth could have foreseen a thing like this? Better to have lost a dozen cigarette boxes and said nothing about it. To his wife. It's all your doing. I told you so from the first. I wish to goodness Roper would come. Mrs. Barthwick sharply. I don't know what you're talking about, John. Barthwick turning on her. No, you, you, you don't know anything. Sharply. Where the devil is Roper? If he can see a way out of this, he's a better man than I take him for. I defy anyone to see a way out of it. I can't. Look here, don't excite Dad. 
I can simply say I was too beastly tired and don't remember anything except that I came in and... In a dying voice. Went to bed the same as usual. Went to bed? Who knows where you went? I've lost all confidence. For all I know, you slept on the floor. Jack indignantly. I didn't. I slept on the... Barthwick sitting on the sofa. Who cares where you slept? What does it matter if he mentions that... A perfect disgrace. What? A silence. I insist on knowing. Oh, nothing. Nothing? What do you mean by nothing, Jack? There's your father in such a state about it. It's only my purse. Your purse? You know perfectly well you haven't got one. Well, it was somebody else's. It was all a joke. I didn't want the beastie thing. Do you mean that you had another person's purse? And that this man took it too? <laughs> of course he took it too. A man like that, Jones, will make the most of it. It'll get into the papers. I don't understand. What on earth is all the fuss about? Bending over Jack and softly. Jack now, tell me, dear. Don't be afraid. What is it? Come. Oh, don't, mother. But don't what, dear? It was pure sport. I don't know how I got the thing. Of course, I'd had a bit of a row. I didn't know what I was doing. I was... I was... Well, you know, I suppose I must have pulled the bag out of her hand. Out of her hand? Whose hand? What bag? Whose bag? Oh, I don't know. Her bag. It belonged to... In a desperate and rising voice. A woman. A woman? Oh, Jack! No! Jack jumping up. You would have it. I didn't want to tell you. It's not my fault. The door opens and Marlowe ushers in a man of middle age, inclined to corpulence in evening dress. He has a ruddy thin moustache and dark quick moving little eyes. His eyebrows are Chinese. Mr Roper, sir. He leaves the room. Roper with a quick look round. How do you do? But neither Jack nor Mrs. Barthwick make a sign. Barthwick hurrying. Thank goodness you've come, Roper. You remember what I told you this afternoon. We've just had the detective here. Got the box? Yes, yes, but look here. It wasn't the charwoman at all. Her drunken loafer of a husband took the things. He says that fellow there... He waves his hand at Jack, who with his shoulder raised, seems trying to ward off a blow. Let him into the house last night. Can you imagine such a thing? Roper laughs. Barthwick with excited emphasis. It's no laughing matter, Roper. I told you about that business of Jack's, too. Don't you see the brute took both the things? Took that infernal purse? It'll get into the papers. Roper raises his eyebrows. Hmm. The purse. Depravity in high life. What does your son say? He remembers nothing. Damn! Did you ever see such a mess? It'll get into the papers. Mrs. Barthwick with her hands across her eyes. Oh! It's not that. Barthwick and Roper turn and look at her. It's the idea of that woman. She's just heard. Roper nods, and Mrs. Barthwick, setting her lips, gives a slow look at Jack and sits down at the table. What on earth's to be done, Roper? A ruffian like this Jones will make all the capital he can out of that purse. I don't believe that Jack took that purse. What? When the woman came here for it this morning? Here? She had the impudence. Why wasn't I told? She looks round from face to face. No one answers her. There is a pause. Barthwick suddenly. What's to be done, Roper? Roper quietly to Jack. I suppose you didn't leave your latch key in the door. Jack sullenly. Yes, I did. Good heavens, what next? I'm certain you never let that man into the house, Jack. It's a wild invention. I'm sure there's not a word of truth in it, Mr. Roper. Roper very suddenly. Where did you sleep last night? Jack promptly. On the sofa there? Hesitating. That is, I... On the sofa. Do you mean to say you didn't go to bed? Jack sullenly. 
No. If you don't remember anything, how can you remember that? Because I woke up there in the morning. Oh, Jack. Good gracious. And Mrs. Jones saw me. I wish you wouldn't bait me so. Do you remember giving anyone a drink? By Jove, I do seem to remember a fellow with... A fellow with... He looks at Roper. I, I say, do you want me... Roper, quick as lightning. With a dirty face? Jack with illumination. I do. I distinctly remember his... Barthwick moves abruptly. Mrs. Barthwick looks at Roper angrily and touches her son's arm. You don't remember. It's ridiculous. I don't believe the man was ever here at all. You must speak the truth if it is the truth. But if you do remember such a dirty business, I shall wash my hands of you altogether. Jack glaring at them. Well, what the devil? Jack! Well, Mother, I... I don't know what you do want. We want you to speak the truth and say you never let this low man into the house. Of course, if you think you really gave this man whiskey in that disgraceful way and let him see what you've been doing and were in such a disgusting condition that you don't remember a word of it. Roper, quick. I've no memory of it myself. Never had. Barthwick, desperately. I don't know what you're to say. Roper to Jack. Say nothing at all. Don't put yourself in a false position. The man stole the things, or the woman stole the things. You had nothing to do with it. You were asleep on the sofa. You're leaving the latchkey in the door was quite bad enough. There's no need to mention anything else. Touching his forehead softly. My dear, how hot your head is. But I want to know what I'm to do. Passionately. I won't be badgered like this. Mrs. Barthwick recoils from him. Roper very quickly. You forget all about it. You were asleep. Must I go down to the court tomorrow? Roper shaking his head. No. Barthwick in a relieved voice. Is that so? Yes. But you'll go, Rob. Yes. Jack with one cheerfulness. Thanks awfully. So long as I don't have to go. Putting his hand up to his head. I think if you'll excuse me, I've had a most beastly day. He looks from his father to his mother. Mrs. Barthwick turning quickly. Good night, my boy. Good night, mother. He goes out. Mrs. Barthwick heaves a sigh. There is a silence. He gets off too easily, but for my money that woman would have prosecuted him. You find money useful. I've my doubts whether we ought to hide the truth. There'll be a remand. What? Do you mean he'll have to appear on the remand? Yes. Hmm. I thought you'd be able to... Look here, Roper, you must keep that purse out of the papers. Roper fixes his little eyes on him and nods. Mr. Roper, don't you think the magistrate ought to be told what sort of people these Joneses are? I mean, about their immorality before they were married. I don't know if John told you. Afraid it's not material. Not material? Purely private life may have happened to the magistrate. Barthwick with a movement as if to shift a burden. Then you'll take the thing into your hands. If the gods are kind. He holds his hand out. Barthwick shaking it dubiously. Kind, eh? What? You going? Yes. I have another case, something like yours. Most unexpected. He bows to Mrs. Barthwick and goes out, followed by Barthwick talking to the last. Mrs. Barthwick at the table bursts into smothered sobs. Barthwick returns. Barthwick to himself. There'll be a scandal. Mrs. Barthwick, disguising her grief at once. I simply can't imagine what Roper means by making a joke of a thing like that. Barthwick staring strangely. You? You can't imagine anything. You've no more imagination than a fly. Mrs. Barthwick angrily. 
You dare tell me that I have no imagination? Barthwick flustered. Uh, I, I'm upset. From beginning to end, the whole thing has been utterly against my principles. Rubbish! You haven't any. Your principles are nothing in the world but sheer fright. Barthwick walking to the window. I've never been frightened in my life. You heard what Roper said. It's enough to upset one when a thing like this happens. Everything one says and does seems to turn in one's mouth. It's... it's uncanny. It's not the sort of thing I've been accustomed to. As though stifling, he throws the window open. The faint sobbing of a child comes in. What's that? They listen. Mrs. Barthwick sharply. I can't stand that crying. I must send Marlowe to stop it. My nerves are all on edge. She rings the bell. I'll shut the window. You'll hear nothing. He shuts the window. There is silence. Mrs. Barthwick sharply. That's no good. It's on my nerves. Nothing upsets me like a child's crying. Marlowe comes in. What's that noise of crying, Marlowe? It sounds like a child. It is a child. I can see it against the railings. Marlowe opening the window and looking out quietly. It's Mrs. Jones's little boy, ma'am. He came here after his mother. Mrs. Barthwick moving quickly to the window. Poor little chap. John, we oughtn't to go on with this. Barthwick sitting heavily in a chair. Ah, but it's out of our hands. Mrs. Barthwick turns her back to the window. There is an expression of distress on her face. She stands motionless, compressing her lips. The crying begins again. Barthwick covers his ears with his hands, and Marlowe shuts the window. The crying ceases. The curtain falls. End of Act Two Act Three of The Silver Box by John Galsworthy This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Acts 3. Eight days have passed, and the scene is a London police court at one o'clock. A canopied seat of justice is surmounted by the lion and unicorn. Before the fire, a worn-looking magistrate is warming his coat-tails and staring at two little girls in faded blue and orange rags who are placed before the dock. Close to the witness box is a relieving officer in an overcoat and a short brown beard. Beside the little girls stands a bald police constable. On the front bench are sitting Barthwick and Roper, and behind them Jack. In the railed enclosure are seedy-looking men and women. Some prosperous constables sit or stand about. Magistrate, in his paternal and ferocious voice, hissing his S's. No. Oh. Let us dispose of these young ladies. Teresa Livens, Maud Livens. The bald constable indicates the little girls, who remain silent, disillusioned, inattentive. The relieving officer steps into the witness box. The evidence you give to the court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Kiss the book. The book is kissed. Relieving officer in a monotone pausing slightly at each sentence end that his evidence may be inscribed about ten o'clock this morning your worship i found these two little girls in blue street fulham crying outside a public house asked where their home was they said they had no home mother had gone away asked about their father their father had no work Asked where they slept last night? At their aunt's. I've made inquiries, your worship. The wife has broken up the home and gone on the streets. The husband is out of work and living in common lodging houses. The husband's sister has eight children of her own and says she can't afford to keep these little girls any longer. 
magistrate returning to his seat beneath the canopy of justice now let me see you say the mother is on the streets what evidence have you of that i have the husband here your worship very well then let us see him there are cries of livens the magistrate leans forward and stares with hard compassion at the little girls livens comes in he is quiet with grizzled hair and a muffler for a collar he stands beside the witness box and you are their father now why don't you keep your little girls at home i've got no home your worship i'm living from hand to mouth i've got no work and nothing to keep them on how is that livens ashamedly my wife she broke my home up and pawned the things but what made you let her your worship i'd no chance to stop her she did it when i was out looking for work did you ill-treat her livens emphatically i never raised my hand to her in my life your worship then what was it did she drink yes your worship was she loose in her behaviour livens in a low voice yes your worship and where is she now oh, i don't know your worship she went off with a man and after that i yes yes who knows anything of her to the bald constable is she known here not in this district your worship but i have ascertained that she is well known yes yes we'll stop at that now to the father you say that she has broken up your home and left these little girls what provision can you make for them you look a strong man so i am your worship i'm willing enough to work but for the life of me i can't get anything to do but have you tried i've tried everything your worship i've tried my hardest well well there is a silence if your worship thinks it's a case my people are willing to take them yes yes i know but i've no evidence that this man is not the proper guardian for his children he rises and goes back to the fire the mother your worship is able to get access to them yes yes the mother of course is an improper person to have anything to do with them to the father well now what do you say your worship i can only say that if i could get work i shall be only too willing to provide for them but what can i do your worship here am i obliged to live from hand to mouth in these here common lodging houses i'm a strong man i'm willing to work i'm half as alive again as some of em but you see your worship my hair's turned a bit owing to the fever touches his hair and that's against me and i don't seem to get a chance anyhow yes yes slowly well i think it's a case staring his hardest at the little girls now are you willing that these little girls should be sent to a home yes your worship i should be very willing well i'll remand them for a week bring them again to-day week if i see no reason against it then i'll make an order to-day week your worship the bald constable takes the little girls out by the shoulders the father follows them the magistrate returning to his seat bends over and talks to his clerk inaudibly barthwick speaking behind his hand a painful case roper very distressing state of things hundreds like this in the police courts most distressing the more i see of it the more important this question of the condition of the people seems to become i shall certainly make a point of taking up the cudgels in the house i shall move the magistrate ceases talking to his clerk remands barthwick stops abruptly there is a stir and mrs jones comes in by the public door jones ushered by policemen comes from the prisoner's door they file into the dock james jones jane jones jean jones barthwick in a whisper the purse the purse must be kept out of it roper whatever happens you must keep that out of the papers roper nods hush mrs jones dressed in her thin black wispy dress and black straw hat stands motionless with hands crossed on the front rail of the dock jones leans against the back rail of the dock and keeps half turning glancing defiantly about him he is haggard and unshaven 
clerk consulting with his papers this is the case remanded from last wednesday sir theft of a silver cigarette box and assault on the police the two charges were taken together jane jones james jones magistrate staring yes yes i remember jane jones yes sir do you admit stealing a silver cigarette box valued at five pounds ten shillings from the house of john barthwick mp between the hours of 11 p.m on easter monday and 8 45 a.m on easter tuesday last yes or no mrs jones in a logy voice no sir i do not sir james jones do you admit stealing a silver cigarette box valued at five pounds ten shillings from the house of john barthwick mp between the hours of 11 p.m on easter monday and 8 45 a.m on easter tuesday last and further making an assault on the police when in the execution of their duty at 3 p.m on easter tuesday yes or no jones sullenly yes but i've got a lot to say about it magistrate to the clerk yes yes but how comes it that these two people are charged with the same offence are they husband and wife yes sir you remember you ordered a remand for further evidence as to the story of the male prisoner have they been in custody since you released the woman on her own recognizances sir yes yes this is the case of the silver box i remember now well thomas marlowe the cry of Thomas Marlowe is repeated. Marlowe comes in and steps into the witness box. The evidence you give to the court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Kiss the book. The book is kissed. The silver box is handed up and placed on the rail. Clark reading from his papers. Your name is Thomas Marlowe? Are you butler to John Barthwick, MP of 6 Rockingham Gate? Yes, sir. Is that the box? Yes, sir. And did you miss the same at 8.45 on the following morning on going to remove the tray? Yes, sir. Is the female prisoner known to you? Marlowe nods. Is she the charwoman employed at 6 Rockingham Gate? Again, Marlowe nods. Did you, at the time of your missing the box, find her in the room alone? Yes, sir. Did you afterwards communicate the loss to your employer, and did he send you to the police station? Yes, sir. Clark to Mrs. Jones. Have you anything to ask him? no sir nothing thank you sir clark to jones james jones have you anything to ask this witness i don't know him are you sure you put the box in the place you say at the time you say yes your worship very well then now let us have the officer marlowe leaves the box and snow goes into it the evidence you give to the court shall be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth so help you god the book is kissed. Clark reading from his papers. Your name is Robert Snow? You are a detective in the XB Division of the Metropolitan Police Force? According to instructions received, did you, on Easter Tuesday last, proceed to the prisoner's lodgings at 34 Merthyr Street, St. Soames? And did you, on entering, see the box produced lying on the table? Yes, sir. Is that the box? Snow fingering the box. Yes, sir. And did you thereupon take possession of it, and charge the female prisoner with theft of the box from Six Rockingham Gate? And did she deny the same? Yes, sir. Did you take her into custody? Yes, sir. What was her behaviour? Perfectly quiet, your worship. She persisted in the denial. That's all. Do you know her? No, your worship. Is she known here? No, your worship. They're neither of them known. We've nothing against them at all. Clark to Mrs. Jones. Have you anything to ask the officer? No, sir, thank you. I've nothing to ask him. Very well, then. Go on. Clark reading from his papers. And while you were taking the female prisoner, did the male prisoner interpose, and endeavour to hinder you in the execution of your duty, and did he strike you a blow? Yes, sir. And did he say, you, let her go, I took the box myself? He did. And did you blow your whistle? and obtain the assistance of another constable and take him into custody? I did. Was he violent on the way to the station? And did he use bad language? And did he several times repeat that he had taken the box himself? Snow nods. Did you thereupon ask him in what manner he had stolen the box? And did you understand him to say he had entered the house at the invitation of young Mr. Barthwick? 
barthwick turning in his seat frowns at roper after midnight on easter monday and partaken of whisky and that under the influence of the whisky he had taken the box i did sir and was his demeanour throughout very violent it was very violent jones breaking in violent of course it was you put your hands on my wife and i kept telling you i took the thing myself magistrate hissing with protruded neck now you will have your chance of saying what you want to say presently have you anything to ask the officer jones sullenly no very well then now let us hear what the female prisoner has to say first well your worship of course i can only say what i've said all along that i didn't take the box yes but did you know that it was taken no your worship and of course to what my husband says your worship i can't speak of my own knowledge of course i know that he came home very late on the monday night it was past one o'clock when he came in and he was not himself at all had he been drinking yes your worship and was he drunk yes your worship he was almost quite drunk and did he say anything to you no your worship only to call me names and of course in the morning when i got up and went to work he was asleep and i don't know anything more about it until i came home again except that mr barthwick that's my employer your worship told me the box was missing yes yes but of course when i was shaking out my husband's coat the cigarette box fell out and all the cigarettes were scattered on the bed you say all the cigarettes were scattered on the bed to snow did you see the cigarettes scattered on the bed no your worship i did not you see he says he didn't see em well they were there for all that i can't say your worship that i had the opportunity of going round the room i had all my work cut out with the male prisoner magistrate to mrs jones well what more have you to say of course when i saw the box your worship i was dreadfully upset and i couldn't think why he had done such a thing when the officer came we were having words about it because it is ruined to me your worship in my profession and i have three little children dependent on me magistrate protruding his neck yes yes but what did he say to you i asked him whatever came over him to do such a thing and he said it was the drink he said he had had too much to drink and something came over him and of course your worship he had had very little to eat all day and the drink does go to the head when you've not had enough to eat your worship may not know but it is the truth and i would like to say that all through his married life i have never known him to do such a thing before although we have passed through great hardships and speaking with soft emphasis i'm quite sure he would not have done it if he had been himself at the time yes yes but don't you know that that is no excuse yes your worship i know that it is no excuse the magistrate leans over and parleys with his clerk jack leaning over from his seat behind i say dad Shh. sheltering his mouth he speaks to roper roper you had better get up now and say that considering the circumstances and the poverty of the prisoners we have no wish to proceed any further and if the magistrate would deal with the case as one of disorder only on the part of Hush roper shakes his head now supposing what you say and what your husband says is true what i have to consider is how did he obtain access to this house and were you in any way a party to his obtaining access you are the charwoman employed at the house yes your worship and of course if i had let him into the house it would have been very wrong of me and i have never done such a thing in any of the houses where i have been employed well so you say now let us hear what story the male prisoner makes of it jones who leans with his arms on the dock behind speaks in a slow sullen voice what i say is what my wife says i've never been had up in a police court before and i can prove i took it when in liquor i told her and she can tell you the same that i was going to throw the thing into the water sooner than have it on my mind but how did you get into the house i was passing i was going home from the goat and bells the goat and bells what is that a public house yes at the corner it was bank holiday and i'd had a drop to drink i see this young mr barthwick trying to find the keyhole on the wrong side of the door well 
jones slowly and with many pauses well i hoped him to find it drunk as a lord he was he goes on and comes back again and says i've got nothing for you he says but come in and have a drink so i went in just as you might have done yourself we had a drink of whiskey just as you might have had and young mr barfwick says to me take a drink and a smoke take anything you like he says and then he went to sleep on the sofa i had some more whiskey and i had a smoke and i had some more whiskey and i can't tell you what happened after that do you mean to say that you were so drunk that you can remember nothing jack softly to his father i say that's exactly what you Shh. that's what i do mean and yet you say you stole the box i never stole the box i took it magistrate hissing with protruded neck you did not steal it you took it did it belong to you what is that but stealing i took it you took it you took it away from their house and you took it to your house jones sullenly breaking in i ain't got a house very well let us hear what this young man mr mr barthwick has to say to your story snow leaves the witness box the bald constable beckons jack who clutching his hat goes into the witness box roper moves to the table set apart for his profession the evidence you give to the court shall be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth so help you god kiss the book the book is kissed roper examining what is your name jack in a low voice john barthwick jr the clerk writes it down where do you live at six rockingham gate all his answers are recorded by the clerk you are the son of the owner jack in a very low voice yes speak up please do you know the prisoners jack looking at the joneses in a low voice i've seen mrs jones in a loud voice i don't know the man well i know you Shh. now did you come in late on the night of easter monday yes and did you by mistake leave your latch-key in the door yes oh you left your latch-key in the door and is that all you can remember about your coming in jack in a loud voice yes it is now you have heard the male prisoner's story what do you say to that jack turning to the magistrate speaks suddenly in a confident straightforward voice the fact of the matter is sir that i'd been out to the theatre that night and had supper afterwards and i came in late do you remember this man being outside when you came in no sir he hesitates i don't think i do magistrate somewhat puzzled well did he help you to open the door as he says did anyone help you to open the door no sir i don't think so sir i don't know you don't know but you must know it isn't a usual thing for you to have the door opened for you is it jack with a shamefaced smile no very well then jack desperately the fact of the matter is sir i'm afraid i'd had too much champagne that night magistrate smiling oh you'd had too much champagne may i ask the gentleman a question yes yes you may ask him what questions you like don't you remember you said you was a liberal same as your father and you asked me what i was jack with his hand against his brow i seem to remember and i said to you i'm a blooming conservative i said and you said to me you look more like one of these here socialists take whatever you like you said jack with sudden resolution no i don't i don't remember anything of the sort well i do and my words as good as yours i've never been had up in a police court before look here don't you remember you had a sky blue bag in your hand barthwick jumps i submit to your worship that these questions are hardly to the point the prisoner having admitted that he himself does not remember anything there is a smile on the face of justice it is a case of the blind leading the blind jones violently 
i've done no more than what he has i'm a poor man i've got no money and no friends he's a toff he can do what i can't now now all this won't help you you must be quiet you say you took this box now what made you take it were you pressed for money i'm always pressed for money was that the reason you took it no magistrate to snow was anything found on him yes your worship there was six pounds twelve shillings found on him and this purse the red silk purse is handed to the magistrate barthwick rises his seat but hastily sits down again magistrate staring at the purse yes yes let me see there is a silence no no i've nothing before me as to the purse how did you come by all that money jones after a long pause suddenly i declines to say but if you had all that money what made you take this box i took it out of spite magistrate hissing with protruded neck you took it out of spite well now that's something but do you imagine you can go about the town taking things out of spite if you had my life if you'd been out of work yes yes i know because you're out of work and you think it's an excuse for everything jones pointing at jack you ask him what made him take the roper quietly does your worship require this witness in the box any longer magistrate ironically i think not he is hardly profitable jack leaves the witness box and hanging his head resumes his seat you ask him what made him take the ladies but the bald constable catches him by the sleeve Shh, magistrate emphatically now listen to me i had nothing to do with what he may or may not have taken why did you resist the police in the execution of their duty he want their duty to take my wife a respectable woman that hadn't done nothing but i say it was what made you strike the officer a blow any man would have struck him a blow i'd strike him again i would you are not making your case any better by violence how do you suppose we could get on if everybody behaved like you jones leaning forward earnestly well what about her who's to make up to her for this who's to give her back her good name your worship it's the children that's preying on his mind because of course i've lost my work and i've had to find another room owing to the scandal yes yes i know but if he hadn't acted like this nobody would have suffered jones glaring round at jack i've done no worse than what he has what i want to know is what's going to be done to him the bald constable again says shh mr barthwick wishes it known your worship that considering the poverty of the prisoners he does not press the charge as to the box perhaps your worship would deal with the case as one of disorder i don't want it smothered up i want it all dealt with fair i want my rights magistrate rapping his desk now you have said all you have to say and you will be quiet there is a silence the magistrate bends over and parleys with his clerk yes i think i may discharge the woman in a kindly voice he addresses mrs jones who stands unmoving with her hands crossed on the rail it is very unfortunate for you that this man has behaved as he has it is not the consequences to him but the consequences to you you have been brought here twice you have lost your work he glares at jones and this is what always happens now you may go away and i am very sorry it was necessary to bring you here at all mrs jones softly thank you very much your worship she leaves the dock and looking back at jones twists her fingers and is still yes yes but i can't pass it over go away there's a good woman mrs jones stands back the magistrate leans his head on his hand then raising it he speaks to jones now listen to me 
do you wish the case to be settled here or do you wish it to go before a jury jones muttering i don't want no jury very well then i will deal with it here after a pause you have pleaded guilty to stealing this box not to stealing Shh. and to assaulting the police any man as was a man your conduct here has been most improper you give the excuse that you were drunk when you stole the box i tell you that is no excuse if you choose to get drunk and break the law afterwards you must take the consequences and let me tell you that men like you who get drunk and give way to your spite or whatever it is that's in you are are a nuisance to the community jack leaning from his seat dad that's what you said to me Shh. there is a silence while the magistrate consults his clerk jones leans forward waiting this is your first offence and i am going to give you a light sentence speaking sharply but without expression one month with hard labour he bends and parleys with his clerk the bald constable and another help jones from the dock jones stopping and twisting round call his justice what about him he got drunk he took the purse he took the purse but in a muffled shout it's his money got him off justice the prisoner's door is shut on jones and from the seedy looking men and women comes a hoarse and whispering groan we will now adjourn for lunch he rises from his seat the court is in a stir roper gets up and speaks to the reporter jack throwing up his head walks with a swagger to the corridor barthwick follows mrs jones turning to him zenith a humble gesture oh sir barthwick hesitates then yielding to his nerves he makes a shamefaced gesture of refusal and hurries out of court mrs jones stands looking after him the curtain falls end of act three end of the silver box by john galsworthy